Good. We're in Isaiah. Fabulous book of prophecy. Exciting, a little frustrating in some respects because being such a large book, we generally have to move along at some kind of a pace to keep it moving, and yet there's so much here. But we are about to enter a section that some scholars call the Little Apocalypse. We're in chapter, starting chapter 4 through 27, 24, 25, 26, 27, four chapters, called by some the Little Apocalypse. And what you will notice right away as you've been patiently going through what I sometimes feel is a dirge of judgment on all these nations, fortunately Isaiah has this incredibly eloquent style, and he keeps throwing things in there. Even in the, in the deep, dark passages, there's always a... A little jewel he throws in there for our pickup, if you will. But at this point, at verse 1 of chapter 24, he really shifts gears. Up till now, we've been talking about the nation. He essentially has been talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and then systematically going around the nations around Judah, speaking of Assyria and Edom and Babylon and, and so forth. But at this point, you really can see him shift gears. He really alters his style. It'll become very, very obvious that uh, the scope of what he's talking about in these few chapters is clearly the whole world globally as one package. And that for Isaiah is a, is, is a little different. Let's just jump in here. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. This is one of those passages that I have not seen the liberals argue this has already been fulfilled in the past. <laughs> I have not seen the world turned upside down. Morally, it seems to be. But uh, we'll see quickly that Isaiah's vision here is very, very vivid and very literal. Verse 2, And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with the master. And with the maid, so with her mistress. And with the buyer, so with the seller. And as with the lender and with the borrower. As with the taker of interest, so with the giver of interest to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken his, this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The earth languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance and frustrated the everlasting covenant. Your King James may say broken, but I believe the Hebrew word really means frustrated. You see, there's a contradiction. Uh, it's almost like an oxymoron. You can't break an everlasting covenant. If you've broken it, it's not everlasting, right? You follow me? And that used to bother me until I found out that the word broken doesn't mean broken. It means frustrated. Now, the question that you can study on your own, but I'll give you a few hints, is which covenant are we talking about? One of the things you'll want to do as a serious student of the Bible is really study covenants. There's a number of them. And they're all quite different. Some of them are limited. Some are very broad. Your comprehension of God's dealing with Adam and his descendants will be, uh, it's essential that you understand the relationships that God has ordained. Some of them quite conditional. Some unconditional. Uh, we all speak of the Sinaitic covenant, the law, the giving of the law. Very, very much uh, conditional, not everlasting. How do I know it's not everlasting? Because I have the book of Galatians, which makes that very clear. Abraham, covenant with Abraham, different thing altogether. Unilateral, one-party covenant. God himself establishes it. And with God alone, it can't be broken. He's faithful. It required nothing of Abraham. Even if it did, later on, Jesus says he was faithful as far as God was concerned. But in any case, see, God's the only party to it if you study that carefully. So the covenant with Abraham is unconditional. And that's not a technicality that uh, is essential because of, for an understanding of the Old Testament. That's a technicality you need to understand to keep from falling in the heresies that are being aggressively promoted within the body of Christ. One of the things that really disturbs, you know, we see a lot of the occult. We see the Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan. We see a lot of spooky stuff on the horizon. You know, strangely enough, that doesn't scare me. Maybe it should. <laughs> uh, it doesn't scare me. What really scares me are the subtleties that are being aggressively sold, promoted within the body of Christ. When I say that body, what I mean, I mean the churches collectively. The idea that the church is Israel, that God is through with Israel. Those are heresies. And uh, I'm hoping that those of you in this group are biblically taught soundly enough to recognize those kind of lies when you see them. God is not through with Israel, has a major role, and Jesus himself speaks of those who call themselves Jews and are not. 
meaning the church that calls themselves Israel, is a, a, the synagogue of Satan. That's in Revelation 2 9 and 3 9, for those of you that may be a new idea. So learn the covenants, but then of course we have um, the Davidic covenant, which of course relates to the Messiah. And yes, indeed, Israel rejected it, but will again have a role uh, in that. And that, of course, is what prophecy is all about. Paul, in his definitive statement of the gospel called the Book of Romans, spends three chapters hammering this home. This isn't Chuck Missler's off the wall ideas, there's plenty of those. This is centerline, root, solid theology. And your reference is Romans 9, 10, and 11. Important to, to master that. But there's also a covenant with Noah. This covenant involves the whole earth, not just Israel, the one he's talking about here, the whole earth. And it's my suspicion that what we're dealing with here is the franchise that was given to Adam and renewed with Noah to take care of the earth. If you have an ecological bent, boy, this is, this is what we're talking about. Because the, the earth is also defiled under the inhabitants thereof. And so forth. And they frustrated the everlasting covenant. Therefore, verse 6, hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. God's dealing with sin is always burning. Our God is a devouring fire. You find that in Zechariah 5, and well, all through the book of Isaiah, we'll be touching upon that enough. We'll keep moving here. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry hearted do sigh, the mirth of the timbrels cease. And the noise of those who rejoice endeth, and the joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. There is crying for wine in the streets. All the joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. And the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. Thus shall it be in the midst of the land among the people. There shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. Okay. Very, very eloquent language. Very consistent with, and you'll see even more of that as we go here, with the book of Revelation. It sounds heavy. It sounds frightening. It is coming. It's interesting that we in our society find it easy to visualize situation normal. Things will continue as they always have as we scurry about our business community with its ups and downs, as we watch the various entertainments, and as we just go day by day, it's easy to believe that everything's going to always stay the same. And that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the days of the Son of Man be, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the flood came. Nothing wrong with eating and drinking or giving marriage. That's not his point. The point is his business as usual, we're up to the end. So that's coming. And that's what the book of Revelation expands in great detail from chapter 4 through 19. Fortunately, as we shall shortly see, that doesn't affect you and I. We may see some of it. doesn't mean it's going to be easy pickings from here on, but it does mean that the heavy stuff will come after we're gone because God has promised that we, will, we are not appointed to wrath. And that's what we're talking about here is God's wrath coming. Let's move on. Verse 14. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify the Lord in the fires, even in the name of the Lord God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea. For from the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, or more specifically, my misery, my misery, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. When you see phrases like that, it reveals in the English what is very prevalent in the Hebrew, that this all is very, very symphonic, very, very uh, poetic. Not a dry prose, but a very high-styled, eloquent expression on the part of Isaiah. Getting more specific, verse 17. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon the O inhabitant of the earth. Uh Uh-huh. Here we find this pit. We're going to hear more about this pit as we go here. This pit is also a prominent feature of the passages in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 9. Some strange things are tucked away in the abuso in the Greek, the, the bottomless pit. Now, if you are study geometry, you know where the bottomless pit has to be, right? Where is the only place that a bottomless pit can be bottomless? Center of the earth. And you say, Chuck, you've got to be kidding. You're educated in a scientific background. Do you really think that it's in the center of the earth? Yes, I do. That's what he said it was. I have these rather quaint, some people say romantic, 
in, in a technical sense, notions, but I do. I think it's there. And, uh, but in any case, what comes out of the Abuso? Revelation chapter 13 describes two beasts, and they come out of where? The pit, the Abuso. I mean, we'll say, where's the Antichrist coming from? Syria, Jerusalem, Europe. Well, perhaps, but where does he really come from? Out of the Abuso. He's a strange guy. He's going to be Satan's man. And he's going to emerge probably not very far away. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. Oh, that's interesting. He that comes up out of the midst of the pit. I believe that's the guy that we see chronicled in Revelation 13. That is what's called there the beast. He has 33 titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. Coming world leader is my favorite title because it's sort of neutral. Most of the other titles cause us to be myopic. Not that they're not valid, but they cause us to focus on too little. He is going to be a broad gauge guy, most attractive leader the world has ever seen. He is going to be embraced by everyone. Israel is going to accept him as the Messiah. Incredible. How will you recognize him when he comes? Because he'll bring us our temple. Interesting. I personally have this weird idea that he's going to somehow fulfill the expectations of Islam and the New Age and you name it. He's going to be an incredible leader. And he's going to have solutions. And he's going to have an incredible career. Mid-career, he betrays Israel. And we see him for his true color. But that's getting ahead of the story. And that's coloring him with emotion that may be missing when he first shows up. If you follow me. Coming world leader. Most of what we know about him is in the Old Testament. So we pay heed here. But in any case, it's interesting how all of this, every phrase from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 is consistent. Holy Spirit has engineered this presentation, so we should not be surprised to find it has what you would call integrity. And here we have indeed, he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit, ha, huh, shall be taken in the snare. Who, how is he going to be destroyed? By the brightness of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. Now that phraseology is interesting. We suddenly shift, if you will, from the book of Revelation to the book of Genesis. That phraseology may echo in your ears from Genesis 6, 7, 8, the flood of Noah. The flood of Noah is more than a flood caused by rain. The windows of heaven were opened, whatever that means. And the fountains of the deep and so forth. If you study Noah's flood, you realize there's far more going on there than just a lot of rain. In fact, a lot of things going on besides just a flood. The whole ecology of the earth was changed. But the point is, this phrase echoes Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, and other places. The earth is utterly broken down, verse 19. The earth is thoroughly dissolved, and the earth is moved exceedingly. Verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a booth. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Has that been fulfilled in history? Not so you'd notice, right? The interesting, shall be removed like a booth. And the word booth is reminiscent of the Feast of Booths, these little temporary shelters that a Jewish family will erect in their backyard to commemorate Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth, which will be five days from Yom Kippur. Temporary structures, and the earth will be removed like a temporary structure, it says here. Heavy, heavy stuff. But that's just the beginning. Verse 21, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Now, the kings of the earth upon the earth, that we can relate to. We see that in the book of Revelation. The kings of the earth hide in caves saying, rocks fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. In the whole, in the whole sweep of the book of Revelation, we're sensitive to that climactic judgment upon the kings of the earth. But notice something else here. The Lord shall punish the host of the high ones. Remember Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's the real game. There are those that point out the physical world is simply a manifestation of a spiritual battle. So what you and I see is just the tip of the iceberg as the expression goes. That the real conflict involves the host of the high ones. Interesting. And the kings of the earth upon the earth. Something is the strangest thing to me. Everybody has their hang-ups, I guess. The strangest thing to me as I study the end times and see these climactic things uh, chronicled in uh, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Revelation, so on. Is that the kings of the earth, all of them, not most of them, not just the bad guys, all of them, take up war against 
the Lord and against his anointed. That's incomprehensible to me. I can understand them being wrong. I can understand them being subject to some pretty stupid policies. But I can't imagine, I can't imagine taking up arms against the God of the universe. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, I'm sorry. I'd love to be able to chronicle that in credible terms. I find that amazing. Of course, every time I go to Washington, I come back and figure nothing's amazing. <laughs> Every time I hear they go on vacation, I have a sigh of relief, you know. But anyway, the host of the high ones. Incidentally, those of you that are uh, the kings of the earth take up war against the Lord and his anointed. Psalm 2. In fact, let's, maybe we should look at that. It's a good point. Well, let's pause for a second do a little bit of background. Let's take a look at Psalm 2. Psalm 1, very comfortable, very root, basic psalm. We get to Psalm 2, and the more you read it, the stranger it sounds. But what you need to understand is... The clue to understanding Psalm 2 is to recognize that it's a conversation among three people. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's provocative for that very reason. One of them raises the question, Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Ooh, that's interesting. Saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He who sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. It's not a figure of speech. It's a specific geographic location on the planet earth. I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. Interesting. That, incidentally, is a fulfillment of the promise that Gabriel gave Mary in Luke. That's not an Old Testament idea. It's also a New Testament idea. Don't lose sight of that. Verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. Interesting psalm. Interesting psalm. And when you get home tonight, you can reread it and, and uh, annotate it like a shooting script. Figure out who's saying what to whom. That's your homework assignment. Okay. The kings of the earth are going to take up arms against the Lord. Boy, that's a... Other references for that kind of theme is uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, and Acts chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. Similar related uh, expressions. Revelation 17, 14, Acts 4, 26 and 27. But that brings us down to verse 22. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered, where? In the pit. There we go again. The pit. And shall be shut up in prison, and after many days shall be visited. The pit. Interesting. We might take a look at a few passages just to keep ourselves stirred up here. Let's take Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. You might remember 2 Peter 2 when you hear things analogous to these, this foolishness they call the Jesus Seminar where they cast votes on what Jesus said. I'm always in, intrigued with the arrogance that seems to come from certain quarters. I've gotten to the point in life when I see a lot of degrees by a person's name. I regard each one as a sign of insecurity. <laughs> now I'm being serious, but I know I'm usually flippant, but I mean it seriously. I'm always intrigued by that. I am always, uh, always have a feeling if they're expecting if, God, if they cast enough votes, God would resign. But when you run into that kind of thing, remember in Second Peter chapter two. Once I was covering for Hal on his radio program, when we have the call-ins, it was right after that Jesus seminar. I thought somebody surely is going to bring that up, and I was all ready just to read Second Peter two, but no one brought it up. So okay. But verse 4 is what we're interested in tonight, just to highlight where we're at. Second Peter two four. For if God spared not. The angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, or to Sheol, or, what, or to Tartarus's 
a phrase that only occurs here in the scripture. It's apparently a deep, deep part. And most scholars sort of assume it's also an allusion to the abuser. And delivered them into the ch- into chains of darkness to be served on judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah and so forth. And he goes on to make his point. It's interesting that God's attitude towards sin never changes. God is unchangeable. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's the point that Peter makes and also Jude makes. It's not that, gee, he was angry then, but he's, you know, he'll wink at it today. Wrong. God's attitude towards sin is unchanging. Your sin and mine. Fortunately, his grace provided an answer. Jesus Christ. And the more you understand the righteousness of God, the more you understand his indignation to sin, the more you understand that sin cannot coexist with him, that sin in his presence is destroyed. You and I in his presence would obviously be what? Destroyed. We understand the extremes he went to to make fellowship possible through the gift, through the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ. But for if God spared not the angels of sin, but cast them down. So these are real, these aren't figures of speech. These are real entities, powerful, sentient, hostile entities that fell way back then. And we'll talk more about that when we get to Isaiah 45. We're going to get into that whole thing again. Delivered them in chains of darkness. This, I believe, connects with Revelation 9 because there's some peculiar hostile creatures that are turned loose for a while. And I suspect that we can read Revelation 9 all you like and still have no idea what that all implies. Heavy stuff coming down. As long as we're in this kind of a mood, let's pop over to Jude. I love Jude. A little one-chapter book written by the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both James and Jude were his brothers, did not believe in him until after he was uh, resurrected. But uh, go on to do some... Noteworthy things. And of course, Jude tells us all kinds of things. He tells us about prophecy before the flood, that the whole Enoch thing and all that. But we're interested tonight in verse 6. Speaking of the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. What's that alluding to? As you know, I believe that links to Genesis 6 and the whole conditions uh, preceding the flood. But left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. And again, this uh, seems to link to the same thing Second Peter does. And I believe these are the echoes that I hear when I look at verse 21 22. The host of high ones that are on high. They shall be gathered together as prisoners gathered in the pit, and they shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days they shall be visited. Then we get to verse 23. Then the moon shall be confounded, the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. The moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed. You know, it's interesting to me how the book of Joshua is a preamble or a foreshadowing, a hint, a very elaborate hint of the book of Revelation, how Yehoshua sends in two witnesses before the battle of Jericho. And then he goes in with the seven trumpet thing and, and so forth. And every detail of the book of Joshua is fascinatingly a, an anticipation of the book of Revelation. How his enemies align themselves under a leader called Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. And how they're defeated by signs in the sun and the moon in the battle of Beth Horon and so forth. And how the kings, when they're defeated, hide in caves and so forth. Joshua's going into the land. Three nations have already been taken care of. Seven are left. Seven nations are in the land. Interesting. Another Yehoshua is going to dispossess the land of the usurpers. Except he's not talking about a parcel of ground we call Palestine. He's talking about the entire planet Earth. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. But again, in verse 23, The moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. Analogous, if you will, to the battle of Beth Horon, where the sun, was said, he said, Be thou silent, and the moon in the, in the valley of Agilon. Joshua 10, for those of you who may want to preview that. Now, it's interesting. All this is going on, this heavy, apocalyptic, wild stuff, right? When does it happen? When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Those aren't figures of speech. They're not allegorical. They're actual geographic places. You can go there, touch, feel, and see. Grab a pocket full of dirt and bring it home in a bottle. That's that ground, Mount Zion. Ground just a little to the west of uh, Teropian Valley. As the city of David outgrew that and went down that Teropian Valley, up the hill, that was Mount Zion. Generically speaking, a synonym for Jerusalem in general, but it's a very specific mountain, the Mount Zion. And in Jerusalem, no ambiguity about Jerusalem. Who's going to reign there? The Lord of hosts. And who is he going to reign 
before. Who's going to be part of his court? Who will be there? His ancients gloriously. That's interesting. What do you mean his ancients? I believe that tells you about the first resurrection. The book of Revelation clarifies this. Yes, there is a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. And don't be confused by being just. That means justified in Christ. No one will be justified by their own works. Those that are insisting to be judged by their works are in for a shock. Because they will be. <laughs> there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. What Revelation tells us is something that we don't have clear visibility elsewhere. And that is that there's a thousand years between those two resurrections. And also recognize that the first resurrection is not an event, it's a category. It's not a moment alone. Why do I say that? Because who is the first fruits of them that slept? Jesus Christ, when was he res resurrected? 1900 years ago. So whenever the resurrection that we associate with the rapture occurs, understand it's a category that embraces Jesus Christ 1900 years ago. So it's a category, not an event. And that helps us understand some of the theology. But the tragedy is that those that are unsaved will also be resurrected and have a destiny, an eternal destiny. There's something intrinsic about all of us, saved or unsaved, that we're eternal. We're all eternal. The terrifying thing is your, your eternity will either be in God's presence or hopelessly forever alienated from God's presence. And you and I have no capacity to understand what that means. So I believe Christ speaks in analogies. The lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Not that it, I'm not just saying it isn't a literal lake. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying I believe that's his way to try to communicate to us what this dimensionality that we have that we don't even appreciate here means if we are, in fact, alienated from God. That's what I believe Gehenna is all about. No one will be in hell for their sin. They'll be in hell for rejecting the provision God has made for their sin. Okay, he's going to reign before his ancients gloriously. There is, in that verse, an overtone of a resurrection, the resurrection of the just. We're going to hear more about that before this, these few chapters go by. In fact, we're moving into, coming up against one of my favorite portions of the Bible. Let's move on. Chapter 25, verse 1. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city a heap, a fortified city, a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be no city. It shall never be rebuilt. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, and the city of terrible nations shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, and when the blast of the terrible ones is like a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of aliens as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. Now that phrase, of course, Isaiah is using antithetically. You and I are familiar with the biblical use of the term branch, the Hebrew word tzemek. It's interesting to me that there's 20 different words that can mean branch in the Hebrew, but the word tzemek that is used is always used of Messiah, and it's the word tzemek that's the name of the principal star in the constellation Virgo, the virgin, the tzemek, the seed of the corn and the tzemek, the, the branch. Speaking, of course, of the branch, the root of David, it's a messianic term. And we've seen that several places in Isaiah already. We've talked about it. We'll be seeing it again. But here, Isaiah is using it flipped over. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. Different guy. Who's this guy? This is obviously it's Satan's man that we're talking about, the coming world leader. The branch of the terrible ones shall be what? Brought low. Reminds us that in Genesis 3.15, that famous verse that starts all prophecy in the Old Testament about the Messiah... When God declares war on Satan, he says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And out of that, we get the famous title of Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. We hear about it a lot. Don't forget there's another seed, the seed of Satan. Jesus talks about that in John chapter 8. In his little dialogue with the Pharisees, they called him a bastard. In the politeness of the King James, you may miss that. Let's go for it. Let's go. John 8. I want to highlight this to you so as you read the Gospels, don't let the politeness of the King James hide from you the dynamics of what's really going on. John 8 is one of these fascinating dialogues between Jesus Christ and the religious leadership. 
It fascinates me that Jesus Christ, every time he encountered a sinner, it was with compassion and forgiveness. Every episode, woman taking adultery or you name it, it evokes in him one of care, compassion, concern, forgiveness. There's one group of people that has just the opposite reaction every time you see it, and that is where he speaks vituperatively, violently, vigorously, and that's against the professional religionists of that day. And, of course, this is one of those exchanges, and we obviously don't have time to go. We won't divert to go through the whole thing. But when you get to verse 18, he, Jesus says, I am the one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that hath sent me beareth witness of me. And he, uses, he makes reference to his Father, Father God. In verse 19, they said unto him, Where is thy Father? So you miss that unless you're watching closely. What they're saying, they're alluding to his apparent illegitimate birth. And by the way, if anyone says there's no evidence for the historicity of Jesus Christ, that's wrong. It's in the Talmud. The Talmud refers to him as the illegitimate son of Mary. Interesting. And they said unto him, Where is thy father? And Jesus answered, Do you know neither me nor my father? And he, he takes off here. If you'd known me, you would have known my father. And he goes on. Before he finishes, he tells them, You want to talk about fatherhood? I'll tell you about fatherhood. When he gets to verse 44. He says, ye are of your father. And he's speaking to the Pharisees. These are the professionals. These are the ones that made a career of trying to keep the law. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father, he ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. And he keeps, he, he keeps going at it. You know, they, of course, say he has a demon and all this. He keeps at it. He says, in verse 56, is your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was, and was glad. And the Jews said unto him, you're not even 50 years old. How can you see Abraham? He says, verily, I, verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. You and I miss what that says. They didn't. They took up stones to cast at him. Why? Because he was claiming to be the voice in the burning bush. And of course, he slips out. Interesting. Gets kind of aggressive. I love that. That's kind of fun. I've forgotten how I got this far afield. I think I deviated once before. We read down verse 5, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. That, of course, echoes Revelation 19, when the branch of the terrible ones will indeed be brought very low by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Verse 6, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, a fat things full of marrow of, on, of wines on lees, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. The veil that is spread over all nations. We know about the veil that's over Israel. Paul tells us about that. They're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans 11.25. What's interesting is here and there we're beginning to see that veil lifted. I think it's kind of exciting. But I think the veil will be formally lifted when the church is out of here. When is the church out of here? When it's complete. And God will once again deal with the planet Earth through Israel. Through the 144,000 and all of that. That Revelation 7 and 14 detail for us. Back to Isaiah, verse 8. He shall swallow up death in victory. Oh, what a fascinating phrase. I thought Paul invented that in 1 Corinthians 15. No, he was drawing upon Isaiah. Remember? 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, which climaxes at the end of it, of course, in the rapture. But he, in verses 54 and 55, he mentions about death and victory, grave words I sting, and so forth. Quoting from Isaiah... You know, uh, 25, 8. He will swallow up death and victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. I thought that was John in the book of Revelation. Yes, but he's drawing from where? From Isaiah. There's at least 357 direct quotes in Revelation from the Old Testament. If it sounds strange to us in Revelation, it's only because we haven't mastered the Old Testament. God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Praise God, huh? For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trampled down under him, even as straw is trampled down for the dunghill. And, of course, Moab is a literal place, but it also sometimes is used figuratively to refer to those that are false profession. And you can do a study of Edom and Moab, Ammon. Those are all worthwhile doing. Start from where they actually started in Genesis. Track their history and their relationship with Israel. And you'll get a flavor not only of their future, but also of how they're used idiomatically in the Scripture. 
Verse 11, and he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them as he, he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands in the fortress of the high fort of thy wall shall he bring down. Lay low and bring to the ground even to the dust. The apocalypse in Isaiah continues. Chapter 26, verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation that keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That sound familiar to you? That's because Paul quotes it in Philippians 4 verses 5 and 6. Trust ye the Lord forever for in the Lord God is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down those who dwell on high. The lofty city layeth low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. Even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. One small footnote. With my spirit within me, I will seek thee early. I'm intrigued as I read the scripture how the precious time with the Lord is first thing in the morning. When do sheep feed? First thing in the morning. This is a blow for me because when I wake up, that's my precious time. I'm one of these guys, a morning person. I usually wake up very early and I'm just full of ideas and that's my fresh time. A dear friend of mine pointed that out to me. I thought, gee, that's interesting. What I need to give to the Lord is my best time. Not the leftovers at the end of the day when I'm tired, so I'll do my little five-minute reading. No, 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 no. First thing in the morning, feed. Give the best time of your day to God. Seek the early. Watch for it. You'll notice the scripture emphasized that. I don't want to get on a legal trip. I'm just suggesting that if you're going to give the Lord some time, give him your best, whatever that is. Okay, verse 10. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. Now verse 13 tells the tale. O Lord, our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. That's something we need to remember. It's easy to forget. When you see pain, suffering, disease, injustice, all those things that grieve your soul. Remember who the God of this world is. The God of this world. Who's that a title of? Satan. Yes, a usurper. And yes, the world ultimately, in a final sense, is the Lord's. But there's a usurper in control at the moment. Permissively in control, I understand. But still, let's not lose sight of the fact that we have a hostile adversary who's got control of the strings right now. If you don't believe that, look at the media. <laughs> look, at the, look around. And it's getting worse. Lord God, other lords beside thee have had dominion of us. And by the way, when we speak of Satan so glibly, we're not talking about a singular person. Yes, he's in charge. He has an organization. He has a large, powerful organization. Anyone that does not believe in Satan should try opposing him for a while. I think Spurgeon made that crack, and I think it's eloquent. People come up to me, gee, Chuck, I appreciate your ministry. What can we do for you? Let me tell you what you can do for me. Pray. You got a minister or a ministry? that you respond to, that you like, the most powerful thing you can do is pray for it. That's more important than anything else you can do. You can give money, time, all that. That's great. The most powerful thing you can do is pray for it. If you're impressed with a particular tape ministry, pray for them. You're impressed with a particular speaker here on the radio or on tape or whatever, pray for him. If he's responding to you, then the God is using him. If God is using him, he's got opposition. If he's got opposition, he needs your prayer. You want to do something that God will honor? Pray. Jude and Peter say, contend for the faith. What do you mean, contend for the faith? Go buy a gun and go after it? What do you mean, contend for the faith? How do you contend for the faith? Well, lots of ways. 
But the most powerful thing you can do is pray for it regularly. I have a friend that has one of these. He buys himself a watch that has a has an alarm in it, and he sets the alarm so it rings every hour. And every hour it rings, he prays for me. I just found that out. Blew me away. Just a few minutes, you know, holds me up. And he has, he has not just me alone. He has a little list of burdens before the throne of grace. I haven't found out about it because he happened to share. Yeah, that, that's the way he prayed. He went off while we were talking. Oh, that's time. What time? Time to pray. Interesting. Take prayer seriously. Every man of God who was at all used by the Lord was a man of prayer. The libraries are full of examples. All the greats of history were men of prayer. Sounds corny. Sounds simple. That's the insidious part of it. It's simple. And yet it isn't. Real, real prayer. Did I get off the subject again? Not really. No, no. When you're talking about other lords beside thee of a dominion over us, we're talking about spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6. There's more to it than that, but that's the heavy artillery. Prayer. By thee only will we make mention of thy name. Boy, there's a lot of theology there. There have been cases where someone's demon possessed, and you can tell because they are incapable of pronouncing the name Jesus Christ. And boy, that's spooky. Verse 14. They are dead, they shall not live. They are diseased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. Lord, I'm moving into my fun part here. Pay attention. Verse 16. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. As a woman with child who draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. It interests me how frequently the idiom of a woman in travail is used of end time prophecy. If you study the word travail, many times it is literally speaking of a woman in travel in the Bible. But there's many times also it's used idiomatically, poetically, of the end times. Jesus Christ himself, when he gave his confidential briefing to his four inside disciples, he mentioned that all the, he mentioned some non-signs and then some signs. And he said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. The word sorrows is actually the Greek birth pangs. And the, the idiom of birth pangs is a frequent phrase used by the prophets. Isaiah is it frequently, Jeremiah does, Ezekiel, so on. A woman with, as, as a woman with child, pains to be delivered. That's the way it's going to happen. Little by little and faster and faster. Also got a recent discussion about the book of Revelation. Twice in the book of Revelation it uses, and these things must shortly come to pass. You and I, when we hear that in the English, it sounds like shortly, very near it shall come to pass. And we wonder, gee, John wrote a long time ago, what's he talking about? The word in the Greek is entaxi. It's the word from which we get the word tachometer. What it says is when these things start to happen, they happen rapidly. By the way, have you noticed that? Have you noticed things are kind of happening rapidly? Berlin Wall came down. The experts that have been working on it for 40 years were shocked. Look at the Soviet Union. I mean, unbelievable. And what's interesting, you know, it may be a, catch you and I surprise, by surprise. I'll tell you what disturbs you. When you talk to the experts, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, have lunch with him and chat about it, you find out he's surprised too. Oh, really? That makes me a little nervous. You got your friends in Langley scratching their head and saying, Wow, we didn't expect that. That makes you a little uncomfortable. You guys are supposed to know. And that's the other side of the coin, too, of course. It's been fashionable for a decade to piddle on the pant legs of the intelligence community. <laughs> and then when you need them and they don't have a budget, you get a little shook, you know. Somehow our media should make up their mind, you know. But anyway. I'm going to hear about that, I guess. <laughs> Verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the earth fallen. And from verse 19, fasten your seatbelt, I think this is one of the most interesting passages in the Old Testament for you and I. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. That's pretty interesting. Isaiah knew of the resurrection. He also knew he would not live to see the rapture. See? Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall 
cast out the dead. So far, no problem. It's an eloquent, articulate, specific, expressive discussion of the first resurrection. But let's go on. Verse 20 and 21, I think, are great fun. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Interesting, interesting passage. And the more you study it, the more provocative it becomes. The word come, I believe, links to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. The book of Revelation is divided into three sections according to John's 19th verse of the first chapter. He is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta after these things. What things has he seen? Chapter 1, the vision of Christ, in which 24 titles are introduced that become the links, the identity links through the rest of the book. No problem. Write the things which are, chapters 2 and 3, those seven churches that existed at that time. Jesus Christ dictated seven letters to seven churches, comprising in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Those seven letters, those two chapters, are probably the most important chapters of the entire book. Everybody rushes through and gets to chapter 6 on, boys, and that excite. No, 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 no. Wait, time out, guys. The rest of it, you're going to see from the mezzanine. You're a spectator. Chapter 2 and 3 affects you and I. Mystical, mystical verses. Every verse, every detail in those two chapters are subtle, sophisticated, and highly, tightly organized. Seven letters, seven churches. Study them carefully. They affect every one of us. Personally, collectively, and in, the, in, in time. But after the churches... It says, write the things which shall be metatauta after these things. And the first thing is, come. John is told, we're caught up into heaven. And idiomatically, he's transported through time. He's given a vision of what's going to happen at least, you know, 2,000 years after he wrote it. And that's what Revelation chapter 4 through 19 is all about. The expansion of the 70th week of Daniel. Come, my people. Enter thou into thy chambers. What do you mean, thy chambers? The answer to that is in John chapter 14, verse 2. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Wow. Where are we going to be when all this happens? With Him. And we have our own mansions, our own chambers. Interesting idea, isn't it? Isaiah says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee, and hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment. No, oh, just a short period of time. How long do you hide? Until the indignation is past. The word indignation refers to God's wrath, his judgment of sin. You should praise God that he hasn't issued his wrath yet. Because when he starts, he finishes. He does the whole job. It wouldn't be just to judge part of it, not the other. If he's going to judge, he's going to judge it all. And the, God's, the day of God's vengeance is yet future. When we get to Isaiah 61, we'll examine the passage that Jesus Christ himself used to initiate his ministry. He quoted from the first two verses of that chapter, and then shut the book in the synagogue of Nazareth. He says, this day is that prophecy fulfilled in your ears. And as he does that, he's left out a phrase. He read it, but he stopped at a comma and shut it down. Because the phrase he left out was, and the day of vengeance of our God. He wasn't ready to do that yet. Thank goodness. If he had, you and I wouldn't be here. If Jesus Christ came a few weeks ago, a few months ago, a few years ago, there's some people in this room that would not be members of the forever family, that would not have a destiny, an eternal destiny with God. Praise God that he has tarried. Praise God that he has waited. Set aside your second mortgage for the moment. Praise God that he is tarrying. And the more he tarries, the more it gives you an opportunity to pray for your loved ones and to be responsive to his will in your life. But anyway, he says, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is passed. When God pours out his indignation, when the seven bold judgments are poured out in the book of Revelation, you and I will not be here. There are many good teachers running around that try to sell you differently. I've been through that. Let me tell you, I really am convinced from a lot of reasons, and this is one of them, that uh, the church is a very special group. Not all believers are in the church. That's another fallacy that we all stumble in. We always assume that a believer is in the church. No, no. If a believer is between Acts 2 and the rapture, he's in the, he's in the ecclesia in the church. There are believers prior to Acts 2. Want some examples? Abraham, David, Noah, you name it. 
They're saved. Don't misunderstand me. But they're not in that peculiar entity that Paul tells us all about in his epistles, especially Epistle to Ephesians and so on. The Ecclesia, the church, very special group. There will be millions and millions of people saved after the rapture. The Holy Spirit's taken out in the sense that he indwells the believer. He's going to be taken out by taking out the containers. But he's very busy doing that. That's what Revelation 7 and 14 detail. God will again deal with the world through these 144,000, through the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And millions and millions of every people, tribe, tongue, and nation will be saved. What Israel did not accomplish in her first shot, she's going to get a chance, and she will fulfill. That's what the book of Revelation... You've got to understand the book of Revelation's Jewishness from chapter 4 on. So you and I are a very special group. If you're in Jesus Christ, you have incredible... An incredible destiny. Incredible even in the context of the believers. You take the various categories that God talks about. So recognize, first of all, when it says saint or elect, it doesn't necessarily mean the church. It may be referring in some passages to a time after the rapture, interestingly enough. There's also groups of people in the millennium, but that's a whole other study. We'll get to when we get Isaiah 65 and so on. Isaiah is going to cause us to get into all of these issues in subsequent chapters, but let's move on here. Isaiah 26, 20 21. Interesting verses. I wouldn't build doctrine on them. Don't misunderstand me. I just find them exciting. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For the behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. He clearly has not punished the iniquity. That's one of the problems we have. That's one of the great theological issues. Why do the wicked prosper? And why do the righteous suffer? The ostensible injustice of that burdens us. God is not is not punishing the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity yet. You follow me? And yet he will. And when he does, where will we be? In our chambers. <laughs> Neat. Okay, chapter 27. It's the fourth of these um, rather provocative, <laughs> this little, what they call the little apocalypse. Chapter 27, verse 1, In that day the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword shall punish the Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the sea monster that is in the sea. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's interesting that the sword has three aspects. It's hard, great, and strong, and also Leviathan is mentioned in three contexts there. But in any case, that may be just, it may be nothing more than the linguistic style of Isaiah, or it may be something perhaps subtle. Uh, we won't badger that one. The, the sword of the Lord, of course, is introduced in Deuteronomy 32. It also comes in Isaiah 34 and 66. We'll talk about the sword of the Lord again. But... Uh, with his sword, he will punish the Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked servant. This leads to a whole other study that you can get into as to what on earth is the Leviathan. And uh, the Leviathan shows up in Psalm 74, 14, and um, also Psalm 104, 26. But perhaps most of all echoes in our ears from the passages in the book of Job where Leviathan shows up. And, and uh, of course, the book of Job is a fun book because it's fascinating to me to see the diversity of comments by various commentators. You know, most books, if you collect a dozen commentaries on any particular book, they, they'll have slightly different viewpoints, but in general, they don't, you know, TV it that much. The book of Job is off the wall because uh, good commentators, you know, you remember Job has his three friends that, uh, you know, with friends like that, you don't need enemies. They pontificate that obviously Job's in trouble because of his sin and all that. And the good bulk of Job is these dialogues with these three guys. But then a fourth guy shows up, Allah, and uh, it's interesting when God finally speaks out of a world when on behalf of Job, he rebukes the three friends, but he never rebukes Elihu. And some commentators think Elihu is a young upstart, because he's a younger man, is an upstart and other... You don't know whether he's wrong or whether he's the uh, uh, Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a, that's a range of viewpoint, isn't it? But also, one of the other things you'll run into in the book of Job is that there are a lot of comments about Leviathan. Some think it's a crocodile. There are all, all kinds of guesses as to what these references to the Leviathan in the book of Job really refer to. But if you look at it carefully, while it, in fact, in some places may refer to some specific kind of creature, it also the language transcends that. And the Leviathan seems to be something far spookier. You might want to know that there are uh, ancient myths from Babylon and elsewhere that speaks of a Leviathan as having seven heads. And in, the, in the, a couple of these passages in the Bible, it speaks of the heads, plural, of Leviathan, which suggests that the term is idiomatic and alludes to, of course, none other than the ruler of this world. Punish the Leviathan, the piercing serpent here in Isaiah. Interesting phrase. There again, we get the hint that the allusion here isn't to a literal, specific 
zoological creature, but something uh, broader and more uh, a spiritual creature. Piercing, even Leviathan, that crooked, he's a piercing serpent and he's a crooked serpent. And the very serpent idea, of course, links us to Genesis 3, the Nachash, the shining one that was made a serpent at the curse. Okay. Verse 2, in that day sing unto her a vineyard of red wine. And if you recall chapter 5 of Isaiah, we again had the song of a vineyard. This is perhaps a reprise of that. Uh, verse 3, I the Lord do keep it. I will water it every moment lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Fury is not in me who would set briars and thorns against me in the battle. I would go through them. I would burn them together. Oh, let him take hold of my strength. Let him make peace with me and he shall and he shall make peace with me. And there again we have the echoes, uh, I feel, of Psalm 2 again. Verse 6. He shall... This is a great verse. They want me want to mark. He shall cause those who come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and shall fill the face of the world with fruit. One of the most dramatic things that you can see with some of the videos or movies and so forth, uh, f- the film footage, is of Palestine, as the British used to call it, from, say, uh, earliest photographic records to the present day. And, of course, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., they, of course, cut out part of their siege practice to cut down all the trees. And so they desolated the land. And as the centuries went by, it just got from went, things went bad to worse, from bad to worse. When the Ottoman Turks took over that land, they, it was just destroyed. And, and if, you, if you see the ancient footage of uh, as photograph- photographic technology uh, developed, of course, there's all kinds of footage of, of, the, of the land in the you know, 1910, 20, 30s in that time period. And, of course, it's desolate. It's either swamp, which is useless, or desert. It's just awful. But in the late 1800s, some Jews started to emigrate there. And then, of course, the Zionist movement in the 20s and so forth, and, and uh, the Balfour Declaration, ultimately climaxing, of course, in the State of Israel being announced May 14th of 1948. And it's absolutely fantastic to see the change in the ground. What's uh, always intriguing to me is when you fly over Israel is to notice the contrast of Israel versus the land east of the Jordan, which is still desert and desolate. And yet Israel is green with trees and, and uh, orchards and farmland and, and how they've just reclaimed out of the rocks. They have just made a fertile ground. There is a Talmudic expression which argues that the land will only give its fruit to the Jew. When, and whether that's just a colorful um, commentary or whether it, it's clearly that the land is yielding. Let me tell you an example of that. It says here it will fill the world with fruit. Israel today is not only an exporter of fruit, it's the third largest exporter of fruit in the world. And it's a land that's one third the size of San Bernardino County. Isn't that interesting? When you go through Europe and you see flowers in the markets, not all, but most of those flowers are exported from Israel. And, of course, the fruit is the, is, is, is the big thing, the third largest uh, exporter of fruit in the world. Kind of interesting. He shall cause those who come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Sounds like poetic license. No, it's literally true. And I do want to remind you that every time I've made a gross mistake in my reading of the Bible, it's because I didn't take it literally enough. As extremist as I am, I still find that when I've looked back and some of the things I've taught and realized they were wrong, it's because I didn't take it literally enough. Word of the wise. Verse 7. He hath smitten him as he smote those who smote them, or is he slain according to the slaughter of those who slain by him? In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. And he stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind, or Sirocco. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten asunder, so that the idols and images shall not stand up. Yet the fortified city shall be desolate, and the habitation forsaken, and left like a wilderness. There shall the calf feed, and there shall he lie down and consume the branches thereof. When its boughs are withered, they shall be broken off. The women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he who made them will not have mercy on them, and he who formed them will show them no favor. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come who were ready to perish in the land of Assyria. 
and the outcasts of the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. And of course, this echoes Isaiah 19. If you recall, Isaiah 19 closed with this interesting trio of blessing on Israel, Assyria, and Egypt, obviously speaking of the millennial time. Uh, one other comment that's interesting, we have the great trumpet here, the same trumpet that's in Joel chapter 2. Let's pop over to Joel chapter 2. Joel 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a feast, that is set apart a feast, and call a solemn assembly. That's what a trumpet's all about. That's why it's so interesting. That's why we watch with such you know, uh, prophetic interest with a feast of trumpets. That's obviously going to prove to be very significant. But then verse 16 is kind of interesting. Gather the people, sanctify the, con- the congregation, assemble the elders, gather children, and those that nurse at the breast. Let the, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber, and let the bride out of her room. I wonder what that means. I wouldn't build doctrine on it, but it's kind of interesting. The bridegroom goes forth from his chamber, and the bride from her room. Uh, well, wait a minute. Who's the bridegroom? You know, prophetically, we, we have the idiom uh, of the bridegroom as being Jesus Christ, right? Who's the bride? Well, she's coming out of her room. Interesting. Would I build a doctrine on it? No. But with the views that I have, I find that kind of interesting. Isaiah, the little apocalypse, chapters 24, 25, 26, and 27. Very different style for Isaiah. We won't get into chapter 28. 28 through about 35 has um, more judgments and things. And uh, we'll uh, sweep through those chapters next time. There's lots of little surprises uh, in this too. We'll talk about the covenant of death. The treaty that Israel makes with, with Sheol. We, hear that in, we, we read about that in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And uh, Isaiah will talk about the covenant with Sheol and so forth in the coming passages. So they'll have a, a, clear, a clear prophetic orientation for us. When we get to, though, chapter 35, that will close this whole section of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is clearly in two parts, two styles. The styles are so dramatic, they give rise to this idea that there were really two Isaiahs, which of course is not true. You can prove it's not true lots of ways, in spite of the fact it's such a widespread uh, idea in scholastic circles, it's wrong. The unity of the book of Isaiah speaks for itself in its use of idioms, the way it ties together, but the most convincing proof is John 12, where the Gospel of John tells you that Isaiah is one book. Because he quotes from Isaiah 6 and he quotes from Isaiah 53 and says that same Isaiah said again. He ties it all together. So it saves you all that grief. But the point is, let's having still, even though we know that, let's recognize that Isaiah's, Isaiah's style is going to dramatically change at chapter 40. We'll finish this section of Isaiah with these judgments and all this stuff. Uh, when we get to chapter 30, uh, finish chapter 35. Next time we'll take, you know, the rest of it and we'll sweep through. They're short chapters. We'll get through all that. Then there's a four-chapter parenthesis that's historical. Chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39. There's four chapters. That's why some people divide Isaiah into three parts. Isaiah, the first part, the one we're talking about. Then there's this little four-chapter. It's almost like a, a section of Second Kings tucked in there. And then, of course, we're going to go from chapter 40 on. Now, the chrono- chronological part, the narrative, the historical part, 36, 37, 38, 39, could be pretty interesting because it's going to deal with Isaiah and his relationship with King Hezekiah and some of the very interesting things that occur in his life that also become very, very pivotal in our understanding of that history. And uh, make, uh, it'll make a lot of this much more clear. But where I'm excited to head, and we should be just a, you know, an evening or two away from that, is when we get to chapter 40, Isaiah really changes his whole style. He becomes, you think he's been messianic so far, fashion your seatbelts. Chapter 40 on gets exciting. And some of the things that Isaiah lays out, he lays out in such detail that biblical critics have no way to deal with it. Uh, while they, you know, what, what always, whenever you come across some passage you can't deal with, you late date it. You say, well, Isaiah couldn't have written this. must have been written later. Nonsense. But some of them, uh, well, we'll get to that when we get there. But the point is it's going to be a lot of fun. Isaiah 40 through uh, 66. It's interesting that the Bible consists of 66 books. 39 books are what we call the Old Testament. 27 are the New Testament. 
The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. 39 chapters are the style we're talking about, Old testament if you will, right, like the Tanakh. And then the last 27 will just sweep like the New Testament. And with my tongue in my cheek, as I often point out, obviously the book of Isaiah from 40 on was written by Handel. And, of course, I'm being flippant. And, of course, Handel actually draws upon Isaiah more than just the last 40, uh, last uh, 27 chapters. But Isaiah 40 on is going to be fun. It predicts John the Baptist. It talks about Jesus Christ. And uh, he talks about a lot of other things, too. In fact, most of what we know about the millennium we know from Isaiah. Isaiah is uh, high ground, high ground. And, of course, in the middle of that is the highest ground in the Old Testament. What some scholars like to call the Holy of Holies of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Isaiah 53. Incredible description of Jesus Christ and his mission and his work and what he means to you and I. As eloquent, if not more so, than Paul's epistles. And uh, they say that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. We will, we will have that excitement as we get into those chapters. Uh, many Jewish scholars try to eliminate chapter 53 of Isaiah from their readings. And but we, what's fun to do is go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, go to the shrine of the book where they have the Dead Sea Scrolls laid out, which includes as its, as a, as its key piece a complete scroll of Isaiah. And there's two things that are interesting about that. First of all, that is, there are really, there's not materially different than the Isaiah you and I have in our laps. But the other thing that's interesting, Isaiah 53 is right in the middle of it. Praise God. Much as they'd like it to go away. We will um, continue next time with the our tour, our sweep through this incredible prophet. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. The Word of God. To me, there's nothing more exciting. You know, I've had a I've had a life that the Lord has blessed with lots of adventures uh, for whatever reasons he's chosen to allow me and my weird ways uh, to do almost everything there is to do in one, at one time or another. I've had a rather bizarre life as I look back. And yet of all the adventures that I've had, the most exciting is the adventure of discovery in his word. I think some of my most... Uh, dramatic moments in my life have been in the privacy of my study late at night when the Lord revealed some particular thing to me, caused me to drop to my knees in the privacy of my study and just tears in my eyes and thank him for it. It's just, there's just nothing like it. And you can have that too. Be prepared for the Lord to reveal dramatic things to you as you study his word. He will reward your diligence. And I, I want to call your attention. There are two kinds of reading. There's the devotional reading, the feeding you need to do every day. The feeding you need to do every day. What a lot of people do is they'll take, um, you know, usually have a ribbon. In the Bible you buy it has a ribbon or a marker. It's, it's, no, it's trivial to take two other ribbons. Give yourself three ribbons in there, different colors. Put one in the Old Testament, one in the poetical books, and one in the New Testament. And just cycle them. One, two, three chapters each, whatever you program yourself for. But uh, work your way through the Old Testament. Work your way through the poetical books, Proverbs and Psalms, and work your way in the New Testament. So every day you have a, a mixed diet. When you go out and you grab a snack, do you, you mix your diet a little bit? You know, some meat, some vegetables, whatever, right? Some fruit. Well, my suggestion is to you, you know. But that's devotional reading. And that's your dialogue. See, you pray the Lord, the Lord will speak to you in the Word. And, and, and those passages will leap out and they'll guide you day by day, moment by moment. They'll guide you in your decisions. They will, that's the way God will speak to you. But that's devotional reading. Absolutely irreplaceable. That's your manna. You have to do it every day. Remember the manna? You couldn't do it. You couldn't store it up for a couple of days. You had to do it every day. You couldn't do it for somebody else. You can't root for, read for your kids or the guy next door or mom and dad. You've got to do it. Everyone has to do it their own. That's your devotional reading. That's your feeding. That's also, as Ephesians would call, your washing. You're washed once judiciously, judicially in the blood of Jesus Christ. You're washed every day in the water of the Word. Ephesians. But there's another kind of reading that I'm also talking about. That's where you really get into it. You really make a serious study, book by book. I really believe in going it expositionally, book by book. Take a book and master it. Get into it. Buy a few commentaries, do your digging, really learn the book. Whatever appeals to you. It's a rich banquet. And Lord will, Lord will honor that. And also expect him to show you things. 
to reveal surprises to you as you go through. And, and show, he will reward that diligence that you show. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, that you have given us your word. We also thank you, Father, that that word became incarnate and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, also for your Holy Spirit that has brought us to this awareness of you, this awareness of your word, this awareness of Jesus Christ. We would ask you, Father, in accordance with your commandment, that you might just increase in us a hunger, an appetite, a passion for your word. Help us, Father, to appreciate what you have given us. Help us, Father, to feed on the bread of life. And, Father, we would also ask your very special blessing upon us tonight. We hold up before you in accordance with your commandment. We put before your throne of grace all our hurts, pains, concerns, anxieties. Father, there are those among us that need employment. There are those among us that need healing. There are those among us that have all kinds of needs, Father, that you know better than we can articulate. We put them before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We also ask you, Father, to be with us while we are part one from another. We ask a very special blessing upon our lives. Increase in us an awareness of you within our lives. Help us, Father, just to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.